I'm a mountain man myself. Born and raised in the Ozarks, I'm honestly surprised I've never had to fist fight a Wendigo. Considering the Wendigo fist fight per capita in this area is quite high. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to hear about how the average Neanderthal could probably rip me in half. Today I've got some very scary and allegedly true stories that happened in the mountains. There will be ghosts and there will be monsters, so be ready. Also, I've got a couple of updates. Firstly, I'm trying an experiment. If you want to participate, go to vocaroo.com, record your scariest story from childhood in one sitting without a script, then copy the link to your recording and send it to me at eeriecast.com slash childhood trauma. Secondly, I'm still in need of scary trucker stories, so send them to me at darkstories.org. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against livestock. The Monongal from Synonymous. I don't remember a lot about my grandpa. I was only seven when he passed away, and we only visited once a year. Grandpa was an immigrant from the mountains of the Philippines. He came over when he was in his early 20s with my grandma. Before that, he lived on a small cattle farm with his family. I remember the last time I saw my grandpa. I had a bad case of the flu, and back then, my parents could not afford to take a week off work. So I stayed on the couch with my barf bucket, watching TV with my grandpa who quietly read a book next to me on the recliner. Eventually, I turned off the TV because of the pain it was causing my head. Grandpa wasn't much in the way of an entertainer. As a father, he spent most of his time working, leaving the children with my grandma. When he asked if I wanted to hear a story, I was hesitant, but I reluctantly agreed. The following story always stuck with me and with the help of my mother, who had heard the story many times herself, I will retell it to you. I did my best to recreate the way he told me this story. It was a busy day on the farm. We were working to repair the damage done by a massive storm, which had swept through that area. My brothers and sisters worked tirelessly on damaged fencing and the various structures we used to house machinery and animals. Back then, we had no weatherman telling us the weather of the days to come. The storm was a big surprise to us. We could tell it was going to rain, but we'd had no idea the severity of it. We spent so much time reinforcing the house in cold rain that we'd forgotten to make sure the cows were sheltered in the barn. It was my duty to find them in the fields and make sure they were okay, especially one particular female who was with child. Flashlight in hand, I walked through the dark, muddy field in the early hours of the morning, before my siblings would begin repairing the damaged structures that day. Our field was particularly unkept, with small segments of forest and lone trees where the cattle could find shelters from the storm. There weren't too many predators in the Philippines, at least no predators that could have threatened me in that field. The worst threat were cobras, and I was fairly confident that my rubber boots would protect me. After some time, I found the herd, and they looked to be in mostly good shape. If anything, they were a little dazed and frightened from the storm. Or maybe it was from the person shining a light in their eyes as they slept. I did a quick count of the cows, and after recounting, I came to the realization that one cow was missing. I quickly realized it was the pregnant heifer. This wasn't particularly surprising. Pregnant cows will usually separate themselves from the herd. I groaned as I walked to find her. It wasn't all too difficult to find her, it was just tedious, as she had a tendency to hide in a small wooded portion at the very back of that field. As I approached the small bundle of trees, I was shocked to see that the cow was not there. 
if she wasn't there, I had no idea where she could be. I was beginning to worry the cow had found a break in the fence and left its field. I wanted to be sure, so I made sure to recheck the fields as I walked back. I shone my flashlight in all directions, looking for her, just in case. What I happened upon, however, was much worse than I could have expected. In the distance, I landed my light on something. It was too far to tell exactly what, but I could see red. I walked towards the thing with apprehension. As I approached, I finally realized what it was. Not because I recognized it, but because the smell of copper filled my nostrils and brought a sense of dread. Blood. It was blood, catching the morning breeze just right and traversing right to me. I'd never seen something like this, especially on this scale. I'd seen the odd rabbit bitten by a snake, but to see a fully grown cow slaughtered so brutally, it was terrifying. I was fairly certain there wasn't something big enough to kill a cow out here, except maybe a crocodile, but the nearest river was too far away. And the marks that were left, it could not have been a crocodile. These were claw marks, distinct large claw marks that covered its disemboweled stomach. I stared into the animal's lifeless eyes, frozen in the moonless night. As I stood with a blank, fearful mind, I heard the loudest, most terrifying and powerful sound I'd ever heard, or will probably ever hear in my life. From directly behind me, there was an ear-piercing screech that made me jump forward. It's hard to describe the sound. If I tried to, I'd have to compare it to something like a cat screeching and an old woman dying, all meshed together with rusty metal scraping. I fell forward onto the corpse of what once was our cow. I crawled on hands and knees before trying to get up, yet slipping on the entrails of the beast and falling hard on my chest. I dared not turn around to face the source of this nightmarish noise. I tried to stand and run, but fell forward again, tripping on blood that soaked the grass. I made one final push to stand before I finally got to my feet and ran away. I'd never sprinted so fast in my life. I must have looked a sight as I whipped through the field with the entirety of my front covered in blood. I ran towards the house, and as I did, I heard the cries of that thing losing volume as I put distance between us. I burst through a dense section of trees to see the path back towards the barn. This led to a small area at the base of the barn, where cows could be fed and watered, or even transferred to another field. The problem with that is because it's where they spend most of their time, the grass didn't grow, leaving a massive dirt patch, and the storm before had turned it into mud. Normally, on such a wet day, I would stick to the sides of the path where the grass overlapped into the mud. But when you're running for your life, mud is not on the forefront of your mind. My eyes widened in fear as I took my first step, sinking just past the sole. By the second, the mud was now up to my ankle, and the third consumed my boot completely. As I desperately tried to pull my feet from the mud, I heard the faintest call of the terrible screech echoing off the hills. This calmed me to know that the thing had fled, or at least had followed me in the wrong direction. As I stood and caught my breath, feet pruning in the mud beneath me, I panted and clasped my knees. I knew if I just waited for sunrise, my parents would notice me missing, sending my siblings to search. I wasn't too far from the house, I could even see the corner of the garage, peeking out from behind the barn in the distance. Whoosh! My eyes widened as the recognizable sound of large wings flapping from behind me startled me out of my state of shock. I turned. Only a few feet away from me, I saw a creature born of nightmares. It was around 40 feet away in the air. In the dark of the morning, I first could only see the large wings, but as it drew closer, I saw the feminine figure of a woman's torso between them. As this thing slowly flew closer, I desperately tried to move, tugging and pulling against the mud, further digging myself into the mud. 
I settled on leaving my boots behind as I stepped out of them to gain no more than four feet of ground between me and that legless form moving towards me. I stood, shoeless feet stuck in the mud, unable to move. What was almost certain death flew towards me at a breathtaking pace. I stared in awe and prepared for unspeakable pain. Suddenly, light began to illuminate the horror before me. It didn't even register in my mind. I just took in the blood-soaked maw and razor-sharp teeth of the creature. Where its legs were supposed to be, there was only blood and leaking entrails, hanging from the hole in the middle of the creature. The beast opened its mouth in a painful cry, but what came out was a distant cry which echoed off the mountains. The thing shielded its face before flying off into the night. By the time it was gone, it finally hit me that the light was caused by the breaking of dawn's first light passing through the trees. It took another half an hour before my brother eventually wrenched me out of the mud. When we returned, my family had many questions. Why was I stuck in the mud? What chased me away from the field? Where was the pregnant heifer? I didn't know how to respond, so I just took them to the body. While my mother and brother stood in shock, examining the body, my father took me to the house, giving me the rest of the day off. He would later explain to me that the thing I'd encountered was called a Manangal, a creature that tears from its lower body in the dead of night to feast upon the unborn, and I had narrowly escaped it. I'm ever thankful to this day for the opportunities this country has given our family, but I'll also be thankful to be as far away from that thing as possible. Grandpa's story scared me more than he expected. After hearing it, I was up for weeks worrying about a half-woman with massive wings climbing her way into my room to devour me. Of course, my mom was not thrilled with my grandpa, but I would always remember my grandpa as the hero who escaped it. Ghost in an Alaskan Home From Shax HS111 These brief encounters happened to my sister and I in either 2012 or 2013. My parents, younger sister and I had moved from the lower 48 states to a town about an hour away from Anchorage, Alaska. I was only 10 years old then, and my sister was 6. Even though this happened a decade ago, and I no longer live in Alaska, I can still easily recall the beautiful view of the mountains surrounding our town. The house my parents were renting was equally as beautiful. The house had three floors, the main floor with a living room and such, a second floor with a bathroom and three bedrooms, and a basement, which had one large open room, a smaller closed off room, and a half bathroom with utilities. Like many basements, ours was inherently creepy. We used it mainly for storage, so we weren't down there very often. The basement had a crawl space that served as more storage and access to the house's pipes or something. Each Christmas, when my sister and I were tasked with pulling out the decorations from the crawl space, we would get chills down our spines as our knees hit the unconventional flooring. Surprisingly, my story takes place upstairs, both in my bedroom and my sister's. Here's my encounter. I've always been a late riser, constantly lying in bed until the very last possible minute, hoping to get a few extra minutes of sleep. One morning, I was awakened by my mom to get ready for school, which was the norm. I lay in my bed half asleep, facing the wall, when I heard my bedroom door open. Oh man, I don't want to get up, I thought. A pair of hands placed themselves on my shoulder and pushed me down. They began to shake me. I was instantly more awake then, but still I was determined to stay in bed longer before school, so I pretended I was sleeping. Still, I was a bit confused. My mom doesn't usually do this. Instead, she'll softly say my name until I respond. But these hands, they pushed down on me similar in style to how CPR is performed, but not quite as hard. 
I continued lying there until my mom left, and eventually I fell back to sleep. When I woke up again, I noticed it was late morning. Weird, I thought. Was there no school today? I rose out of bed and went downstairs. My parents and sister were having a late breakfast. What day is it? I asked, groggily. My mother looked at me. It's Saturday. Why? I groaned, annoyed that someone had tried to wake me up early on a weekend. Then why did you try to wake me up earlier? I asked. I didn't, my mom replied. I frowned and looked at my dad and sister. Did either of you guys? They both answered that they had not tried to wake me up. I was skeptical of my sister, as she was a little kid who liked to bug me. But she showed no signs of lying. I told my parents what I felt this morning, and they brushed it off as me just being tired. I've always been interested in ghosts and the paranormal and such, so the experience freaked me out a little bit. However, I personally never had anything similar happen again, aside from the occasional unexplained footsteps down the hallway. Now, these are my sister's encounters. I believe this happened after my experience. I remember my sister coming to me and telling me about something that happened to her. She said she had woke up in the middle of the night. She felt uneasy. She stayed in bed, trying to go back to sleep, when she felt something poke her closed eyes. She described it as the signature eye poke from the Three Stooges. I believed her, mainly because of what had happened to me. These last encounters were also technically my sister's, but they were told to me by my dad, who witnessed them. It was several years later when he told me this, but it occurred in that same house. He said that he waited to tell my sister and I about it because he didn't want to scare us. Like the other encounters, these were quite brief. My dad was walking down the hallway one day past my sister's bedroom when he heard my sister talking. He thought that maybe she was trying to get his attention, so he stopped and looked into her room. My sister was indeed talking, but not to my dad. My sister sat crisscrossed on the floor with her toys around her, facing the corner of her closet. Her back was turned towards my dad, and she was looking up, talking to, apparently, nothing. At the time, my dad believed it was just my sister's imagination, but he took that idea back when he walked past her room a second time in the middle of the night. He told me he was coming back from the bathroom, and he heard mumbling coming from my sister's room. Now, because it was in the middle of the night, she should have been in bed sleeping, so he went to investigate. When he looked into her room, he saw my sister standing in front of her closet with her head slumped on her chest, asleep. She was mumbling groggily, so my dad couldn't make out what she was saying. Gently, he guided her back to her bed, and tucked her in. Then he went back to bed himself. My dad doesn't spook easily, but he said he was very creeped out by this. I apologize if you find these stories uneventful, but I'm grateful that they were. I've been listening to this podcast for a couple of years now, and I'm glad I haven't gone through anything half as terrifying as some of these stories on here. I don't know exactly what was behind these encounters, but I've always chalked it up to being a ghost since nothing terribly severe happened. My grandfather visited me. From Anonymous. My story took place when I was 14 years old. My mother and I had been living in a small town by the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia for about eight years at that point. My parents were separated. Back then, my grandpa and I were very close, and he would always care for me. But he would later have a stroke and pass away soon after. What I can remember about that day is that my mom and I had traveled several hours to the mall. As we were entering the town, my mom made the decision to halt at the gas station near our house. She requested that I fill up her gas tank while she went to get some snacks and use the restroom. 
I asked her if she would be paying inside, since she was already on her way, and she said that she would. She instructed me to fill only $20 in the tank. After getting out of the car and beginning to pump the gas, I suddenly felt as though someone was watching me. I began to look around, but there was no one else there. So I dismissed that sensation as coming from someone inside the building who was looking out the window, someone that I couldn't see. I ignored it then, after all I was at a public gas station. I finished pumping the gas, put the gas nozzle back in its place, and shut the gas tank. As I began to twist the cap back on, I felt like someone was staring at me again. This time it was much stronger than before. I quickly finished everything up, closing the cover on the gas tank. My mom hadn't gotten back yet, so I turned towards the front of the car to see if she had. She hadn't, but instead of seeing her, I saw a person. But this wasn't a normal person. They were completely white, lacking any distinguishing features. I'd never seen anything like it before, but I immediately felt at ease like I recognized them as my grandpa. It was then that I remembered he passed away a few years earlier. When my grandfather was dying in the hospital, I was visiting my dad at the time. I recall that I never had the chance to tell him that I loved him and that we would be reunited in the afterlife. And now here he was in front of me. I believe that was his angel. Then it was like we spoke without talking out loud. I told him it was wonderful to see that he arrived at these shiny gates as we called it, heaven, without incident, and that I was sorry for not properly saying goodbye. He assured me it wasn't my fault, and I couldn't have done anything about it. He told me he loved me, and wished me to live a successful life, before saying that he had to leave immediately, and he just disappeared. I was powerless to stop him. After this event, I made my way to the passenger door and slid back inside the vehicle as my mother exited the gas station. I was then questioned by her. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, why? I responded. She commented that I appeared to be tearing up, so I simply said that I just got dust in my eyes. I then wiped my eyes with my sleeve to look as though I was attempting to remove the dust. We then returned home, and I went to my room, where I promptly went to bed. Now that I've told my tale, I want to let everyone who didn't get the chance to say goodbye to a loved one know that they already know. Watchdog From The Tear Man This was a horrific encounter I had during a getaway to a mountain cabin. After a long drive, we finally made it, pulling into the driveway of that cabin. It took longer to get there than we expected, our journey hampered by snowfall, but we made it. I stepped out of the car to get a better look at the place, shielding my eyes from the frigid wind and snow blowing around me. It was pretty much perfect, a squat structure on top of a snow-dusted hill, the only sign of humanity for miles around. My boyfriend and I had been looking forward to this trip for months, a weekend tucked away from the world in a corner of the Irish countryside. It's beautiful, said my boyfriend, joining me outside the car. Let's get inside before we freeze to death. We grabbed our things from the car and scrambled our way up the snow-strewn path to the cabin. The short journey from car to cabin alone was enough for me to lose feeling in my fingers and nose. However, the bitterness of the cold was soon forgotten, when we had a fire roaring in the pot-bellied stove, steaming cups of tea in hand and stew bubbling on the range. The absolute darkness of winter fell about the cabin soon. The snowfall passed and the fire burned down to glowing embers. My boyfriend and I, holding hands, looked out at the star-speckled sky above, a crescent moon silently making its journey overhead. I rested my head on his shoulder as I tried to, and failed to, fight off sleep. At some point, I lost that battle. I stirred awake, 
still on the sofa where I had been watching the stars. It was still completely black out. I looked at my phone, wincing at the bright screen. 3.32 a.m. I needed to go to the bathroom. The cabin was a one-room structure, with a communal bathroom about 20 feet down the path from it. During the peak summer periods, it would have been shared with those staying in the other cabins, dotted about the premises. But my boyfriend and I were there in January, very much the off-season. I unfurled myself from my boyfriend, careful not to wake him, and I padded across the floor to the door, slipping on my shoes. I stepped outside into the darkness. A security light above the cabin suddenly activated, giving just enough light to guide me down the snowy hill to the bathroom. I made it without incident, did my business, and started up the path to the cabin again. I was about halfway up the path when I noticed there were large paw prints in the snow, going from right to left. My eyes followed them until they disappeared into the darkness near some brambles. I hadn't spotted any animals during the brief window of daylight we'd had when we arrived. I carried on up the path to the cabin, a little thrown. I didn't like the idea of being out here alone with something lurking around the cabin. Gently, I closed the door behind me. My boyfriend stirred a little in the chair, but didn't wake up. I got undressed and climbed into bed. As I lay there, I began to drift off to sleep, until light suddenly shone in through the door. I quickly looked up to see the security light had activated. It was triggered by movement. Maybe a tree swaying in the night, or maybe some nocturnal animal running about. Then, a shadow caught my eye, long and lurching across the cabin floor. Something, I couldn't tell exactly what, was approaching the cabin door. My heart thumped a little harder. The shadow grew longer as whatever it was came closer. From my angle, I didn't have a clear view of what it was, but as it reached the cabin door, I could make out something like a muzzle pressed against the glass, the glass fogged up with every breath from this creature. I tried to call out my boyfriend's name, but I could only manage a whimper. Then, almost as quickly as the creature had approached, it retreated and the shadow pulled back across the floor. After some time had passed, the security light went off, throwing me back into total darkness. When I'd calmed down a little, I managed to rouse my boyfriend from the sofa and I told him about what happened. Probably just some farm animal that broke out. I wouldn't worry about it, he said, kissing my forehead. I didn't mention the fact we hadn't spotted any animals in the fields around the cabin and doubted there would be any out in this weather, but I was unable to offer any other rational explanation. The next morning, I spotted paw prints in the snow coming up the path, which seemed to circle the perimeter of the cabin before heading off and disappearing on a snowy hill. See, said my boyfriend, just a lost sheep or something that headed back to where it came from. Nothing to worry about. But those were paws, not hooves, I thought. Even someone with a basic understanding of animal anatomy knows farm animals are generally hoofed creatures. The rest of the weekend passed without incident, yet I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Everything around us on that snow-covered hill seemed to have a sense of foreboding. The stark black branches of the trees clawing up to the gray skies, the looming mountains all around us, the complete silence, just waiting to be interrupted by something horrible. I won't lie, it felt good to get home. Time and distance pushed the unease from the front of my mind, and I was thankful to be in the comforting familiarity of the city again. I live by myself in a terraced house tucked tightly in a row between hundreds of houses identical to my own. Each of these rows of houses backs onto an alleyway, used mainly for rubbish bins. It's here where my second strange encounter occurred, almost a week after returning from that cabin. Late one evening, I was taking the rubbish out to the bin, which was at the far end of the alleyway. The weather had improved slightly but was still well below freezing. I carefully edged my way along in the darkness, 
the light from my phone guiding me, slipping on the odd patch of black ice. I made it to the end of the alleyway without falling, depositing the rubbish and turning to make my way back to the house. A low, rumbling growl came from somewhere in the dark behind me. My heart pounding, I looked back, shining my phone light. A wolfhound of unconscionable size stepped out of the gloom, teeth bared in its gaping maw, thick globs of drool falling, and its red eyes staring at me. Without thinking, I began to run in the opposite direction, immediately slipping and falling on the ice. My elbow cracked the concrete and sent a blistering white lightning shot of pain up my arm, causing me to drop my phone and sending it scuttling into the darkness. I flipped onto my back, only to see those red eyes looming ever closer out of the black. I closed my eyes, ready for this creature to sink its teeth into my flesh. But after what felt like forever, I opened my eyes once more, finding only darkness. No snarling creature, only the sound of my ragged breath and the distant low droning murmur of nighttime traffic. After some hesitation, I managed to get up and grab my phone. I shone it around the black alleyway, but nothing was there. Once I made it back to the comforting warmth of my home, the whole thing had seemed absurd. Our alleyway is gated at both ends, so nothing could have gotten in. Besides, we have no wild animals resembling what I'd seen alive in Ireland. No wolves, coyotes, nothing as incomprehensibly large as what I thought I'd seen in that alleyway. The closest would be the Irish wolfhound, a domestic breed of dog, almost three feet tall. Whatever creature I'd seen, though, stood at least a foot taller than that. I put the episode down to tiredness, but to ease my mind, I double-checked all my doors, making sure they were locked, before going to bed that night. Some hours later, as I was getting ready for bed, I went to the bedroom window to draw the curtains. I froze. Staring up at me from the dark alleyway below were those two menacing red eyes again, peering out of the blackness of the night. I blinked hard, only to find the eyes were gone. I closed the curtains quickly, crawling into bed, disturbed by what I'd seen. It was at this point I began to question my own sanity. One instance of seeing something out of the ordinary? It could probably be explained away. Two instances? Perhaps just some coincidence or my mind playing tricks on me. But three instances? Then you're entering the territory of either being correct or mad. I didn't turn out my bedside lamp as I lay there, the dull ache in my elbow coming in waves making my incident from earlier in the evening hard to forget. Too afraid to sleep, I picked up my phone and did a little searching on the web. I discovered a black dog as a recurring motif in English folklore, a supernatural creature often associated with the devil. Naturally, this didn't help abate my fears. The idea of some demon dog following me around is not conducive to sleep. I lay there terrified for hours. Eventually, my tiredness must have overcome my fear, and I drifted off. I was startled awake by a bang on the door. I sprang up. Another bang. It was like something was throwing itself at the door with all its weight. The door rattled in its frame as whatever was outside continued to pound away. I was completely paralyzed, watching the door shudder, threatening to smash the door to splinters. The thing snarled and growled as it thrashed at my door. I was sure whatever it was would burst through at any moment, and then I seemed to inexplicably wake up. Morning light shone around the edges of the curtain. Had that awful encounter all been a dream? Emboldened by the idea all of this lay within the realms of my mind, I made my way to my bedroom door and opened it. My stomach sank. There were muddy paw marks across the white paint of the door and down the hallway. I followed them down the stairs and through the kitchen to the back door, which, despite having locked it last night, 
sat ajar, letting cool morning air rush inside. These muddy paw prints were huge, almost as large as my feet. I pulled the door closed, locking it again, with the fleeting fear that I might be trapping in whatever had come in last night. I sent a picture of the paw marks to my boyfriend, who called me back immediately. Through tears, I told him what had happened. In the alleyway and last night in bed, he had to work that morning so he couldn't come over, but he told me to call the city council to have them send animal control out. This alone was enough to settle me, that someone could come out and capture whatever creature had gotten into my house last night. After several long holds and transfers, I was eventually connected to City Dog Control and Animal Welfare Department. You're through to Dog Control and Animal Welfare. How can I help you? Said a voice unenthusiastically. Hello, I'd like to report a... I paused for a moment. Um, a, a large dog which broke into my house last night. Silence on the other end of the line. Frankly, I didn't blame them for this. The sentence sounded absurd as it left my mouth and I would have reacted the exact same way if someone had told me the same. Okay, and what time did this break-in occur? I'm not sure exactly, I replied, but sometime in the middle of the night, th the dog was big. How big, German Shepherd? Came the voice. No, bigger, I said. Could you tell which breed of dog it was? She asked exasperated. I couldn't, but I do know it was huge. I can send pictures of paw prints it left in my house. She gave me an email address, and I sent the pictures through. Oh, those are some really big paw prints, she said. She suggested to me that city employees are hired on their ability to state the obvious. I'll let the patrols know to keep an eye out in the area, and if you see anything else, don't hesitate to contact us. With that, she took my details and address, and hung up. It was some small comfort to know that people in the area were at least looking out for the animal, not that they would have had to try particularly hard. If it was still about, a giant dog wouldn't be the most inconspicuous of things. I set about cleaning up the muddy paw prints, but couldn't scrub them off my carpets. A permanent reminder of the night. This was in equal parts traumatizing and relieving, on the one hand, I would think of that horrible night every time I saw the paw prints. On the other, it provided some relief that this entire episode was not just in my mind. There was physical proof of its presence. The rest of the day was, much to my relief, unremarkable. I went into the office thankful for the company of others, met my boyfriend on the way home, and made him dinner. He tried scrubbing the paw prints out of the carpet himself, but it was no use. They remained impervious to whatever cleaning product, despite how hard he scrubbed. It was like they were seared into the material. I waited, but the Dog Control and Animal Welfare Department never did call me back. That animal was still out there. My boyfriend stayed over every night for the next week, and while I shuddered whenever I saw those paw prints in the carpet, I gradually thought less about what happened. Time has a way of dulling even the worst of feelings. I decided to try a night alone in the house. Are you sure you'll be okay? I'll be fine, I said. It took a little more to convince him, but eventually he relented. Fine, but call me if anything, and I mean anything, happens. As I closed the door behind him, I was struck by the silence of my house. It was the first time I'd been alone in a while. I went about my usual nightly routine, cleaning up a little, reading and ironing clothes for the next day. Around 11pm, I settled into bed, and with my heart rate rising, turned out the light. I expected to see red eyes staring back at me. Instead, there was only darkness. I put on a news podcast to fall asleep to. At some point, the whine of a hinge pulled me from my slumber. Half dazed, I looked up. My heart lurched right into my throat. My bedroom door was slowly opening. The air filled with this overwhelming musty odor of wet dog. And there it was, padding along at the bottom of my bed, 
muscular haunches rising and falling with every step, red eyes fixated on me. The beast stepped right at the foot of my bed, only inches from my feet under the duvet. It glared at me with deep crimson red eyes like jewels studded in black. I wanted to look away, but I couldn't. I was drawn in by their hypnotic gaze eyes which had borne witness to unspeakable evil, things I could not even imagine, eyes from beyond the mortal plane of existence, blood-red eyes which saw and spoke death. The creature cocked its head slightly to one side, looking pitifully at my weak mortal body lying there, flesh and sinew it could rip into and tear apart in an instant. I tried to will myself into believing I was just imagining it, just some monster escaped from the dark recesses of my imagination. As if to prove me wrong, it lifted one of those huge paws and placed it on the bed, my mattress sinking in under its weight. It was as real as I was. The red eyes glinted, and a wet tongue slipped out from between the salivating lips of the dog, revealing a hint of the sharp teeth behind. This was it. Do something or die. Something in me, I don't know what, triggered. I couldn't end like this. I at least had to fight back. As if a switch were flicked on in me, my body suddenly shook with adrenaline. In one swift movement, I tossed the duvet over the dog, grabbed my phone, and sprinted to the door. The thing roared behind me, but I didn't dare look back. As I reached the doorway, I caught my foot on the frame which sent me sprawling into the hallway. I managed to retain some balance, enough to get me to the stairs and down them. I yanked on the front door, but it wouldn't open. It was locked, and the key was in a dish on a side table. Heavy steps bounded across the floorboards above me. My shaking hands managed, but only just, to grab the key from the table, and, after a few shaky attempts, get it in the lock and throw the door open. I ran into the rain-soaked street, expecting for the dog to land its full weight on me at any moment. It wasn't until I'd made it to the top of the street that I dare look back. Nothing was there. The sleepy street was perfectly quiet, sheets of drizzle falling under the glow of street lamps. Panting, I called my boyfriend. I'll be over in ten minutes he said. I sat on the pavement, just staring at my house. It seemed to taunt me, daring me to go back in alone, to get out of the cold, wet night. I didn't move from that spot until my boyfriend arrived. After comforting me, he pulled a hammer from his car. I didn't want him to go back into the house, but he insisted. I followed, almost whimpering, right behind him, we didn't find any dog, only wet paw prints and my sodden duvet, now with a massive gash through it. I never spent another night alone in that house. A few months after this, I moved in with my boyfriend. While nothing quite like this has ever happened to me in the years since, I don't think I'm totally free yet. It's small things, like when I'm working in the office, and from the corner of my eye, I catch a large black shape on the street below, looking up at me. I turn to look and nothing is there. Or when I'm on an evening walk, and I swear I can see a large mass moving along in the bushes just ahead of me. When I'm alone on the couch, and the inexplicable musty odor of wet dog fills the room. That black dog, it's watching me. Possible Wendigo in Northern Alberta From Diliotis My three friends and I all have loved backpacking for years. We don't get out as much as we'd like to these days, but at least twice a year, we'll take off into the mountains for a two-night backpacking trip. Usually, it's just an excuse to feel like cavemen, eating beef jerky and cooking over a fire. 
This past summer, I called up my friend Jay, asking him if he'd like to try something new. Last year, we'd gone out to Kataman and hiked up to a cave high up in the mountains. Although it was a great trip, marmots had come back to their cave during the night, and I wasn't anxious to have our food stolen and our shoelaces chewed off again. How about Greater Slave Lake? I asked, knowing he would never say yes if he knew how long of a drive it was. We can hike from the road and camp along the lake. That sounds nice, Jay said. When do you want to go? We arranged the time, and since he lived with our other two friends, A and D, he promised to convince them. Two weeks later, we got into my truck and took off. Jay had decided that since I didn't tell him that it was a 16-hour drive, it was my responsibility to provide the transportation, which I was more than happy to do. Hours later, we were talking at a rest stop, stretching our legs and getting some of the good food out of the back. D said, Hey guys, have you heard of any weird creatures up this way? D was really into that kind of stuff, but none of us ever really believed in it. Nah, A said. What kind of stuff are they supposed to have? D continued. There were a couple of people saying they saw Bigfoot, and the local tribe says that historically, there have been a lot of uh, Wendigo in the area. None of us really took that seriously. Soon we were driving again, laughing about how if Bigfoot did come, we'd just make friends with them, like those advertisements from the early 2000s. When we finally arrived, we were getting all of our packs balanced. Jay kept acting jumpy, always looking behind himself. Finally, he just put his back against the truck and scanned the woods. For the record, Jay is usually an extremely calm person. He doesn't really get scared. If we hadn't been talking about the supernatural before coming, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. I went over to him and asked, You okay, dude? You're looking a bit uncomfortable. He gave me a weird look and seemed as if he were about to brush it off, before reconsidering and giving me a weighing expression. I don't know, man. Ever since we got out of the car, I've felt like I have a bullseye on my back. I can't shake the feeling something's watching me. That's weird, I said, not really knowing how to respond. I haven't noticed anything. At this point, A and D had started listening and came over to us. It's probably just the new environment and how far out we are this time, D stated confidently. I imagine that about a hundred squirrels are watching us right now too, he said with a lopsided smile. Jay laughed it off and we all took off into the woods, knowing that if we wanted to make the best of our trip, we would have to get at least one third of the way to the lake before setting up camp for the night. That evening, we had all set up our sleeping gear, and we started a small fire. We sat around and joked about how badly A was burning his hot dogs. He's a really good sport, coming back at us by saying how much more he enjoyed them with a nice crunchy outside. As we laughed, suddenly, Jay went very quiet. He told everyone to shut up. I personally hate being told to shut up, and I was about to keep talking out of spite when I noticed it too. The woods had gone dead silent. Other than the crackling of the fire, we couldn't hear a thing. Usually, this wouldn't be weird in the woods. Animals usually stay quiet when people are around. But that wasn't the case here. We'd been hearing the usual nightlife. Crickets, birds, frogs, and the occasional coyote. But there wasn't even the sound of the wind anymore. It really freaked all of us out. We sat there in the silence for minutes, straining our ears. It was like all of our survival instincts kicked in, and we were like deer when they're trying to detect predators. After a while, I began to calm down, and I looked around the fire. I saw A frozen, with his mouth open, and his hot dog six inches from his mouth. I couldn't help but smile and laugh out loud, thinking about how long he'd been holding it like that. Everyone else laughed too, as soon as they understood what I was looking at. It was like a release from the tension of the last few minutes. 
Pretty soon, we'd all forgotten the events of those moments and went back to our normal, joking conversation. The next morning, as we were packing up, Dee was talking in the background, telling us about his dream he'd had the night before. It was like I was looking at our camp from the trees, he said excitedly, with a twinge of fear in his voice. I, I could see all of us sitting there. Then the next second, I was running through the woods, moving faster than I thought possible. A and I studied him for a second and looked at each other. I didn't want to say it, but it seemed like he was trying to scare us. I could tell A thought the same thing. We didn't really talk about supernatural stuff for the rest of the hike. If you've ever had someone try to scare you and do a bad job of it, you'd understand how A and I felt. We were annoyed. We didn't believe in supernatural things, and it was almost insulting to have Dee try to scare us now. By the time we got to camp, everything had settled down. It was about 6 p.m. and the sun was still pretty high, as it always was in Canada during the summer. The water was beautiful, and we'd found the perfect spot for our camp right on the side of the forest, looking out over the water and the sunset. Jay had brought a backpacking fishing rod, and we were trying our luck with the two lures he'd brought. Honestly, it was so surreal and beautiful that if not for what happened that night, we'd probably still be going out there to this day. The plan was to spend two nights there, then hike all the way back in one day, because we'd be able to get a much earlier start. So that day, we were all expecting to be able to rest our legs after the long hike. Jay and I asked the other guys if they would be willing to make us some food while we went swimming, and they agreed. We didn't go very far or deep, but the water was so serene and warm that we spent a lot of time in there until nearly sundown. We got out and joined the other guys at the fire. Later that night, it's hard to tell how long, but quite a while after sundown, Dee had gotten up to go to the bathroom. Nobody really noticed him go, but we heard a scream coming from the forest, followed by loud swearing and Dee running back into camp. What the heck, he said, obviously very distressed. Did you guys see that? None of us had been looking in that direction, and he'd wandered pretty far into the woods. I saw something in the trees. I heard a sound and I shone my flashlight up, and I saw these eyes staring at me from the trees. I'd be lying if I didn't say I was shaken up from that story, but at that moment my mind went to moose. It's all right, Jay said. It's probably nothing. We can go check it out just to be sure. D shook his head vigorously and stammered. There's no way I'm leaving this fire. That thing, it was seven feet tall at least. It's okay, man, I said, trying to stay calm. The rest of us can go to see what it was. I grabbed my flashlight out of my backpack and I looked over at him. You shouldn't go out there. And there's no way I'm staying at the fire alone. After some discussion, it was decided that Jay and I would go, leaving Dee and A at the fire. Dee didn't want any of us to go, but I was pretty confident that with my flashlight, we'd be fine. My flashlight was like 80,000 lumens and could light up an entire football field all on its own. Jay and I slowly walked into the woods, trying to follow Dee's directions. We did notice again that the woods had gone completely silent, but even with my high-powered flashlight, we didn't see anything. Not even any animals. When we went back, Dee had calmed down quite a bit. We stood there talking for a while. Then something caught my eye, slightly above the other guys and over to the side. I flicked my flashlight over, and there it was. In what must have only been a few seconds, I saw something with broken deer-like antlers and what looked like a deer head, but with a snout that was a bit too long, coming from a creature that might have been eight feet tall. The crystal clear way that I saw it, fully illuminated by my light, it was the last thing I was expecting. It all took literally fractions of a second, but as soon as Jay made a half scream, half choking sound and fell backward, 
my brain just shut off. I then made an attempt to run backwards, and I fell on my back hard. I scrambled around, trying to get up, but the sudden darkness and chaos around me disorientated me even further. I called out to my friends, Hey, everyone stay close. Dee had seen both of our reactions, and without even looking behind him had bolted over top the fire on all fours, burning his neck a little, but the worst part was that he had smacked his knee really hard on one of the stones for the fire and burned his hand. He was lying beside it on his back, wide-eyed looking over into the woods. Since I was already on my back, I scrambled for my light and flicked it on, pointing it back in the direction I saw it. But it was gone. A was still sitting where he was looking, freaked out, but glued to the spot. We all gathered back around the fire, and we were nervously talking, trying to find out what happened. A said that as soon as the rest of us had freaked out, he heard a high-pitched roar coming from behind him, and he'd heard crashing off through the bushes. Jay and I both described seeing a very tall, hunched-over creature with very skinny arms and legs. It had hands and walked on two legs. I remember it being incredibly skinny and having very long fingers with sharp claws on the end and sunken in yellow eyes. Jay agreed, but said it almost looked like someone had hung it in the trees and looked so skinny. We had to decide what to do. D was burned pretty bad on his hand, but less badly on his neck. What was really bad was where he had banged his knee on the rock. It had already swollen up severely, and he could hardly put weight on it. We discussed every option we could think of, but it came down to either we hike out in the dark or we stay until morning, trying to make a break for it afterwards. We all knew that none of us would be able to sleep if we did stay, and we'd have to have one of us keep watch. But in the moment, we chose the worst of the two decisions, deciding to hike out while we were more awake compared to just trying to sleep but staying up all night anyway. We honestly talked for way too long, arguing about everything. Like whether we should take our backpacks or just go. We could walk faster without them, but I hated the idea of not having something on my back to protect me, even a little bit, if I was attacked from behind. I'm ashamed to say it, but none of us could stand the idea of putting out the fire so we left it burning, just clearing anything flammable from around it. None of us wanted to plunge ourselves into instant darkness. My flashlight, the really powerful one, had a very short battery life, so we couldn't use it the entire time. But we did also bring headlamps, and other than D, they all still had battery power. We walked with me in the front, carrying both my flashlight and A's, thinking we could use mine as a weapon if it got too close. At the very least, we could blind it. Second came A, helping D walk, and lastly J, who was carrying D's backpack on his front as extra protection. We got almost halfway there, talking very little, but we all felt like we were being watched. There was still no cell phone reception, but we were on the only trail in the area, and it was very visible. It was also the darkest time of night. At one point, when we all stopped to see if we could hear anything, which we'd been doing once every hour. I decided to turn on my flashlight and look around. Then, we all heard it, plain as day. It was Dee's voice, from the woods, sounding like it was all around us, but especially behind us. It sounded like his voice had been altered, with two voices overlaid on one another. I jumped, and after all the adrenaline that night, I accidentally dropped my flashlight, it landed perfectly on one of the rocks beside the path and broke. I couldn't even move then, I was so scared. The voice paused for a second, then began laughing in a voice that sounded like mine. The same laugh from the first night we were out here. None of us could move. We were too terrified. Before that point, we could pretend that it was just our imaginations but those two sounds assured us that we were in a lot more danger than we could have ever imagined. The laugh went on for so long, I looked down at my flashlight, and I knew it was broken. Our best and perhaps only weapon against this thing. We all circled around, 
facing outward and talking in low voices. The woods had gone back to being silent, and we did not know what to do. Finally, we decided to move up to a spot in the path farther along and get Dee to start a fire while we all stood in a circle around him. We got the fire going, but gathering kindling for it was a nerve-wracking experience, where one of us would dash to a stick we spotted, grab it, and walk backwards back to the fire. Meanwhile, all that night, we would hear one of our voices coming from the woods. I've never been so scared in my life, and I hope I never feel that way again. Once the morning came, the voices from the woods stopped, and the sounds of nature returned. At that point, we felt better, continuing our walk back to the truck. Thankfully, Dee's knee wasn't damaged that badly. The doctor said it was a pretty minor fracture, that he would need to stay off of it for a few weeks. We've talked about it a few times since it happened, but each time we do, we all get scared again. We have been hiking since then, but we always go back to the old spot. If I had any advice to say after all this, I'd say take a moment to calm down, even during a crisis. You never make good decisions when you're scared. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.